My name is Dave Morrow. Nine months of each year, I live in the wild, surrounding me in all directions, thousands of miles of pure wilderness. No roads, no people, no internet, no photography hotspots or social media likes, no top 10 tips to help you out. These things don't matter here. They never did and never will. I come here to challenge my fears and improve my craft, landscape photography. My backpack is filled with two weeks of food, camera gear and tripod, a shelter, a topo map and compass, and a GoPro to document the experience. I travel by foot. This is all I need. This series teaches my entire image creation process, the constant struggle to learn and improve, the drive to solve problems and create better photographs. My goal is to teach you what I know and the path used to get there. I challenge you to abandon the herd, leave the hive, Think for yourself. Stop chasing internet fame, followers, and likes. Blaze a new trail. Create new ideas. Teach others your path. Devote every second to your craft. So thanks for watching, and welcome to the Wilderness Photography Expeditions. So it is now day four of the trip. We just got up probably about two hours ago. Been hanging out in the tent reading, waiting for the sun to pop up over the horizon burn all the ice you can see that the tent's just all ice inside and out some just dropped off there but once the sun pops up dries the tents out we are headed across that river today so we're going to take the pack raft out get across the river and then do some exploring on that side and then head back down towards the vehicles which are about 10 miles away so we'll take the next few days to do that setting up one or two camps on the way back down and then exploring whatever areas we find interesting along the way but going to get everything packed up, get ready, and get on the river. Before we move on with today's video, I wanted to give you guys a quick heads up that in next week's video I will be reviewing all of my images, or at least my favorite images, from the past few months of traveling and kind of deep diving what I like about them, what I don't like, different compositions I got, the settings I used out in the field, and kind of just telling trip stories and other stuff like that while reviewing images. So you can tune in next week for that and I will also review some of the images from this trip. So I also wanted to give you guys one last reminder that I have a landscape photography video course that is open for enrollment right now and it teaches my entire start to finish camera technique and post processing technique. So you will follow me out on the field on a six day backpacking adventure and I will be taking photos and I will be walking you step by step through the entire image creation process in the field. So I'll talk about composition, I'll talk about color and light, and then once I find those compositions, I will take you through the entire shooting technique step by step. Once I get back from that trip, I then load up all the computer, or all the images I should say, on my computer, and I go through the ones that I like, the ones I don't like, and then I edit my favorites from start to finish. Also along with this course, if you get what I've called the foundation package, you'll get to learn my entire photo editing technique from beginner all the way through advanced. So it will cover my entire organization workflow within Lightroom. Then it would go into Adobe Camera Raw. It will show you how I edit raw files. And then we'll jump into Photoshop where I will go through luminosity mask, luminosity channels, all the basics of Photoshop up to advanced skill sets within Photoshop. And some of the photos that are included with these courses are right here. And these are the final results. I'll show you how to edit these start to finish. Right here. Then there are two more right here and right here. Now I have not shown you all the photos, but if you'd like to see what else comes as part of these courses, you can go down below this video and there is a link which will be up until 10 p.m. Pacific tonight. So by selling these courses, I don't have to advertise on YouTube. I don't have to constantly push products to you guys or talk about the latest and greatest gear. I can concentrate on things that actually matter with improving photography, such as skill sets, camera technique, and photo editing. These are skills that you will need long term. If I constantly push the latest gear to you and all these other trends that seem to be disrupting people's actual learning, 
then you don't really learn about what matters in photography, and that is the creative art of photography and how to better your skills to constantly improve your photos. And that's what I'm all about. I want to get better myself, and then I want to teach that back to you. So instead of letting all these gear companies advertise to you, instead of worrying about getting the most clicks on my videos or the most views, I would rather work on creating high-level video courses that are in line with your photography goals, and that helps you to learn long-term. That way I can better myself long-term, you can better yourself long-term, and the cycle kind of repeats as I continue to test my process and then teach it back to you in a clear and concise manner. So if you want to support what I'm doing, if you want to support these videos that I put out for free year-round without ads and support all the free content on my website, written guides, and everything else, you can check out that course below. This is the one way that I fund all these projects. I pay for this out of pocket, all the videos I make, all the travel I do, and in the hope that I will be able to teach you guys these courses at a really high level. So if you want to support me, I really appreciate it, guys. You can find the link below this video. Thanks for tuning in, and let's get back to this adventure. So we came into this bank where we scouted across the river yesterday. We heard this helicopter coming in, and it gets louder and louder, and we're like, what the hell? And then it lands right where we're about to cross. So an ecological survey dropped some guys. There's the helicopter. There's iron. But the helicopter dropped some guys way up river, and then they just floated down, and they're right there. But they're with the Indian tribe. They're not otherwise allowed to come up here in a helicopter. So. It was interesting to see somebody come out here and just get dropped in by a helicopter. We had to hike the hole out. But I just crossed right here, and then I had a rope with me in that raft. Iron was holding the other end of the rope. I came across, and then I put some rocks in the raft, tied it to the rope, and he pulled it back across. So now he's getting ready to come across, and then we're going to head down this way. That's the easy way to exit right there. Pretty good sized bear print. going this way. So we cranked out some miles this afternoon, set up camp, and now I'm just wandering around getting done shooting some really good light back here in the woods. But as the light fades, the sun keeps peeking in and out, getting blocked up by clouds, but still some good light back in the forest. The sun's coming from right over there. You can see it peeking through. Nice side lighting on this whole area. Pretty good night to be out here. I'm just gonna walk over here. Just looking at this tree and foreground with moss all over it earlier. I'm trying to pick out a composition. Get my camera set up and see if I can get something as this light starts to fade. So before I get started with this shoot, I wanted to cover a few different tips or techniques that I use for looking for compositions when I'm in the forest. So anytime you're shooting in the forest, try to look for something that's getting hit with direct sunlight, such as this, where the sun's actually peeking through and providing a focal point for either light rays to work out of or different parts of the composition to get it lit up by. So you can see that there's this center of attention here, but there's also all this really nice detail going on here in the background. And this is a final edit. So this is the complete finished image for this shot. And I cover this in the course link below this video. You can check that out. But you'll also notice here that not everything is lit, meaning there's some places of really high brightness or contrast, such as right here, right here, right here. But then there's also dark areas in the image where the eye can rest and kind of escape from this light, such as this tree trunk, which brings the eyes from the bottom of the image up into the center. And also this tree, which is in silhouette, but I brought out just a little amount of detail right here. If I would have made this tree really bright, it would have kind of taken away from the scene. But this kind of moves the viewer's eyes here. This moves the viewer's eyes here. 
and these trees kind of push this way along with the light rays kind of emitting in all directions. So have a light source in the scene. If nothing's getting hit by light, it just won't be an interesting scene. Everything will be dead and there will be no color. Even if you have something where there is side light like this, the sun was coming in the side here and hitting this scene. You can see some of this sunlight detail down here. If the sun wasn't hitting, I wouldn't be getting all this really nice detail in the water. It would just be kind of dead or flat and there would be no color. This is also another image that's featured in that course below. And both of these are featured in the foundation package. So if you'd like to learn how I edit these from start to finish, including all the techniques that go into them, color theory, composition, and the complete breakdown of photo editing and RAW, you can check out that course where I also move into Photoshop and Luminosity Mask later on. But you'll see that in the back here, there's also some interesting detail. If these trees in the back weren't getting hit with light, everything would kind of be flat like it is over here. See back here, there's no light. But when I was walking through here, I really liked this water detail. So I wanted to line it up so it would kind of flow through right here and bring the viewer's eyes back here. These dark portions kind of just force the eyes from the sides back down to the light in the back. Same with this rock, which is dark. As I talked about in the last photo, it's very important to have some dark areas in your images. So there's that one. So let's look at a few more. We can look at this shot right here. Now this is a massive tree and there's no really harsh direct light in this image. So that's another key. If it's extremely sunny out, it can be great if there are some fog or clouds where you can have light rays like that previous image I showed. But sometimes when you have a partially cloudy day, it's one of the best places or best times to shoot in the forest. Because you notice this is kind of a diffuse light on this tree. If there is no light, I couldn't see all the really fine details as you can see right here. But you can see that there is really nice sharpness to this image because there's side light coming in and hitting this tree. So oftentimes when you see an image, it looks like it's really sharp, but the photographer hasn't actually sharpened the image. It's just really nice contrast within the image that makes it look sharp because there's all these fine details like right here or down in here where these flowers are. You can see the lights coming and hitting and then you can see these fine edges, such as around the edge of this leaf, where that light hits and then it goes into shadow. So nice side lighting also helps. This tree is probably about 15 feet in diameter. You can see these normal sized trees sitting back here. So let's look at another image. This was taken in Utah in the winter. And you'll notice in this shot, I have this really good side lighting coming in on both sides. But then in the background, I kind of angled my shot and walked around this tree for a while until I had a place that the tree was lit up, but it was completely dark in the background. And you'll notice how sharp this looks because you go from a really bright lightness value or luminosity value, close to white, to a dark mid-tones luminosity value. So you can really see that detail around the edges of the tree. And it helps to separate the front of the photo from the back of the photo, providing depth. I also used color theory in this to provide what is called a color harmony between yellow and blue. So I accentuated the yellow here and the dark blue back here, and these colors lie across from each other in the color wheel, so they display very nicely when you post-process them. We will look at one more, and then we will jump back into the shooting technique. But if you guys want to learn how I edit all these different shots from the forest, all these different shots from mountains, rivers and streams, alpine environments, any other landscape shot you can imagine, it's all covered in the foundation package of the course. So this isn't technically a forest shot. This is in a canyon somewhere in the southwest of the United States. And it is tucked way back in there, so it was probably a few days backpacking to get down here. But you can see that the whole scene is not lit. And the tree that is lit is only lit from the side. So the sun was kind of peeking right down through here and hitting this tree, leaving all this in shadow. And if I didn't have this nice dark detail in the foreground, this part of the shot probably wouldn't work. So having that nice contrast between dark and light can really help you when you're working with forest and trees or anything else that has a specific center of attention like this. See if I have anything else for us to look at before we jump back in. Um, here's another example, you could say, of side lighting in the forest. There's not harsh direct light, 
But if there was no light on this scene, you wouldn't see any of the details down in here. It would just be completely dead or flat. So lighting is extremely, extremely important when you're looking to take images out in the forest. This will be the last one, and then we will jump into some shooting technique and finish the rest of this expedition. I could talk about this stuff forever. It's enjoyable. I hope you guys are liking it. Um, let me know in the comments if you want me to go and riff on more stuff like this in the future. I always have fun just opening up images and showing them. But you can see in this scene, the eye kind of starts here, moves back to this dead space in here, which is dark. But then without the lighting up here in the trees, it just wouldn't work. But we have this really nice dappled light all throughout the background here. And where the light hits the trees here, you can kind of see how they're rounded or shaded. If there was no light hitting them, there wouldn't be any depth here at all. But once again, like I said, this and much, much more covered inside that course. So check it out in the description. It'll be available till tonight. Let's get back to the woods and do some shooting. See you guys. So I'm set up vertically right now. Pop the composition up on the back of the screen. See it right there. So in the foreground I have this really nice moss kind of leading the eyes down. And then the side of the composition kind of cuts both of these trees. Now I was shooting this earlier when sun was coming through and directly hitting these trees right here. So I'm really not sure, since there's still some light on the trees, if I can bring out more detail with the light that's coming through right now or what was hitting earlier. But I'll take both and compare and contrast at home and see what comes out of it. So for this one, since there's something in the immediate foreground, I'm going to first focus right back in here. So right here, and that'll focus me from right in this region, everything except this moss right here, all the way back to infinity. Then I'll grab another focal point right here. Just shoot at f11 here. And those are slightly moving. You can see the ferns moving back and forth. So I'm actually going to shoot at f8 instead. Give me a stop faster. And then I'll go up to ISO. I'll go with 320. I just don't want those to be blurry. Last thing I'll do, just pull up the histogram. And I could push this histogram way right, exposed for the highlights here. What I'm going to see is the shutter speed gets a bit too slow. I know I'm going to see movement there. So I'm going to back this down a little bit in exposure compensation. I know I won't be getting the perfect exposure, but it's better than that being blurry. So there's the first shot I'll take. Now after that takes, check the focus and looks good. Then I can make sure that the histograms look good as well. Yep, focus looks good. Nothing's blown out. I want to check and make sure those ferns aren't moving. Not noticeably. I think that'll be alright. So now I can just move my focus point, single point spot focus, right down here in the immediate foreground. I'll zoom in and use back button autofocus. So now I'm focused right here. I'm going to shoot at f16. Actually I'm going to shoot at f22 for this since it's so close. Sometimes unless I shoot f22 I can't get something that is directly in front of my lens like that to focus correctly. I'll go down to ISO 100 right here. And then I'm going to increase my EV a little bit. Now depending on how much light you have coming in through the front of your lens see that blinking that means the histogram is not going to show an accurate representation so to dial in my histogram I'll just open the f-stop then I can move my histogram around and now you can see that if I move exposure compensation back and forth the histogram moves just because f22 wasn't letting enough light into live view I'm gonna go with f16 I don't feel like waiting for that really long shutter speed so if the F16 is sharp, I'm not going to worry about going to F22, but if it's not sharp, I could just focus stack it. It's not a big deal. Sh 
sharp. I just want to check the very immediate foreground. Slightly drops off in focus right here. So I'll just move that focus box down to the corner here. And I can refocus it. There we go. Now if I shoot at f16 there, I can blend the combination of that first shot, second shot focused here, and this third shot focused here. Check the focus there. Looks solid now. So with all three of those shots, it should be all set for that shot. But even though the sun's getting blocked up by clouds, there's still really good diffuse light back in here. Like all these vine maples, you can see, just blowing around. Pretty peaceful place. The river's right over there. Then our camp is right back through these trees. So I was walking back to camp, I found another composition I really liked. Let's see, right here. It's basically approximately looking like that. There's my lens, you can see about what it's looking at. Something like that. I like how there's no distractions up here. Like I can't see any of the sky like if I'm putting it up here. I can just see this leading line going this way on the bottom of my frame got that and that nice separation between this side light coming in the depth created around the edge of the tree and then some of these vines catching light in the back so if you look at this plant it's slightly moving so what I've noticed while shooting this is that I've been taking different shutter speeds and anything that even is as long as a quarter of a second I see a lot of movement since that plant's so close to me. So I've kind of had to piece together this image because I'll focus on one part of the plant, take a shot, but then the other part of the plant won't be in focus because I have to keep my f-stop pretty wide and sure to keep that shutter speed fast enough to capture this image. So I've been focusing here, got a focus point there at these settings, focus point here at those settings. And then I got one back there as well. The other downside is, you guys see my histogram, it's really low. I'm really underexposing this shot. Now, given a lot of the scene is fairly dark, I would still like to push that histogram as far right as possible. But you'll notice if I go way bright with my histogram, even getting it into the mid-tones, shooting it at like f8, gives me three second shutter speed. So that's impossible for a scene like this where some of the parts of the image are moving around. So basically you have to always go through the decision tree of which different settings do you want to sacrifice first. Normally I'll sacrifice f-stop down to around f8 first. From there I'll go to ISO and I'll go up to a max of about 500 before I start darkening down the image brightness using exposure compensation. Exposure compensation and making a darker image is always my last step because I know the each stop that I go down, I half the amount of light in the image. And that means half the amount of dark detail that I can bring out in post-processing. So there's big sacrifices I had to take to get this image, but at least I still got it. So you can see there's the versions of it. And then once I get back home, I'll mix these all together in Photoshop, and hopefully I'll be able to have enough sharpness in each of those key parts of the image that I can pull something together. You can see the light is pretty much dead now on the horizon, but still some really good side lighting into this scene. Awesome detail down in here. The only hard part about shooting in the forest is that if you want to shoot after the sun drops like this, it's going to have to be really still if you want to have settings that are going to give you optimal image quality. When you want to sacrifice image quality, or when you have to sacrifice image quality, like I did there, it's just one of the downsides you have to do, but it's better than not getting the shot at all. So that's why I'm still out here shooting. And I know that thanks to Photoshop and being able to post-process these images, I can get away with stuff that wouldn't have been possible before. So it's always good to have those kind of tricks in your back pocket. It's kind of like a toolbox if you need them. Not the optimal shot that I came away with, but better than nothing. So that helps you guys out when out shooting. Always being able to visualize how to piece a shot together in the worst case scenarios pretty helpful thing to be able to do but headed back to Kent right now gotta get my tent set up and 
hang out for a long time. Sun does not come up till 8 a.m. and it is probably about 5.15 right now. So lots of Kindle time, lots of reading, and maybe get a fire going. So it is just before sunrise and we are up drinking some coffee, gonna get some food and within the next hour get everything packed up and get on the trail. Hoping to catch some more light as we hike back as the sun starts to peak over the horizon. We have one more river crossing in the raft and then we have a river ford to get back to a road walk which is about six miles back to the vehicles. So probably take us most of the day to get back but hopefully there will be some good shooting, good landscape along the way. How far do you think it is to the crossing? We're close. I, I'm pretty sure we're gonna go right next to it. You think it'll the trail will come out to the bank? I, I remember looking at that log from the other. I'm pretty sure from the bank. Nice. Um, it runs pretty close to the river the whole way, so we'll see. We're uh we're trying to find the place we scouted on the way out where we can make a pack raft crossing because we have probably about a hundred feet of rope just real light weight rope so if the river is too wide we can't pull the raft back across and the other person can't get across so kind of have to watch for some place that's not too rough but also not too wide which can be hard to do because usually where it's wide it's shallow and not very rough white water but where it's wide it's not a place where we can cross so we'll see what we can find up here nice runoff That is a big tree. Stand up next to that tree, Iron. Whoa, stand right here. That's a massive tree. One of the biggest. He's, what are you, 6'4"? 6'5". Six, six, yeah, yeah, so your wingspan's what, about 6'5 as well. Put it back up there. Should be exactly 6'5". So that tree's probably about 12 feet in diameter. Minimally. Goes way up. Woo! Awesome. So we had to pack raft across a huge river. We were trying to get down on the other side of the river and we couldn't find a place that was skinny enough to cross the pack raft while holding a rope so we could tow the pack raft back over. So I ended up shuttling bags in the pack raft twice across the river, dropped one bag, came back, got Iron's bag, put it in the raft, and then he swam across the river. You can watch some of his videos. I'll link them when they come up or I'll send them out to you if you're on my email list. So the following is a clip from my buddy's Iron's video, and you can check him out, Iron Taz, on YouTube. And it's of the crossing of this river in a pack raft because my stuff was packed away. I didn't have it out, so we can watch his clip. Hopefully he doesn't come after me. There he goes. Now he's on the move. He's killing it. I'm having a martini back here in the cruise ship. He's crushing it right at the planned spot. Nailing it! There he goes. What do you have to say for yourself? He looks cold. He doesn't have anything to say. Woo! What do you have to say? Is it cold? Feels good. Oh yeah. Back in the game. We're on the other side of the river now. Boat landed. Mm -hmm. Boom. So basically we got across it like that without having to use the rope and got through but we didn't think for a while that we would be able to make it across. We would have just been stuck over there waiting until the water level dropped when things got cold overnight. But this is the last ford we got to do. 
just came across there and then we have a short bushwhack and we are back to the vehicles after a six mile walk on the old dirt road. It always feels good to get completely numb feet on these river crossings because after putting in a lot of miles your feet hurt. When they first get numb they hurt but then after that they're like rejuvenated for another big stand of hiking.